Um, ah, okay. Um, welcome also from my side. I hope you can hear me well. If not, just interrupt me. Um, thank you very much for the invitation for this HALOS webinar series. And um, thank you, Arvind, for the kind introduction. I'm uh, happy to give a talk today about, yeah, as the title says, sample requirements for time reserved experiments, as this is something uh, we are very interested at European XFIL. And um, I will start with giving you just a second, um, an overview about European XFIL and uh, which beamlines are present there and which instruments, and also in particular, which kind of um, labs we have available for, for users and what kind of experiments um, you can do there. Um, the second part of the talk will then be focused on the time reserved experiments, um, utilizing mainly serial femtosecond crystallography and what different uh, time reserved experiments, and what are their sample requirements, and what are their um, yeah, pitfalls and uh, things to consider before conducting such kind of um, experiment. And in the end, I will also give a few examples of um, um, yeah, experiments that have been done in, in, at the European XFL in our labs in the past. So probably you have seen um, similar slides uh, from, from previous meetings um, about European XFEL. It's a linear accelerator, superconducting accelerator, um, located in, at, the, at the border between the federal states of Hamburg and Schleswig-Holstein. And uh, the accelerator starts up and at the premise of DESI, uh, here seen in the picture in the lower right corner. And then it heads towards the west, three kilometers roughly, um, just behind the border of Schleswig-Holstein. Um, and it's all underground. And um, the first two thirds of the tunnel are um, the linear accelerator where, where electrons are accelerated to 17.5 GeV. And then these electrons are used in the different SASE um, beam lines to create photons of, of different wavelengths. And these are in the soft and hard X-ray regime. And these photons are then focused um, to the different instruments. And at the moment, there are six instruments present. They are all located here in the west part um, in, in Schenefeld. And they arrive in the underground tunnel in the basement of this building um, where also the labs are located. So, oops, sorry. If you're interested in like how this works and how it looks and so on, there's uh, on the webpage from European XFL, there's a virtual tour, which works kind of a street view application where you can walk through the tunnel and get information on different sections of the tunnel and how the um, acceleration and the uh, um, um, photon um, generation works. So that might be interesting uh, to, come, to come back to this if you're interested in, in this part. Um, yes, as I said, the experimental hall, which is in the basement of, of the um, headquarter of European XFL, um, is the place where the photons arrive. And from the three SASA beam lines, there are at each end, there are two um, instruments located. So we have at the moment six instruments operational, and there are space for four additional instruments, which should be commissioned in the next like four to five years, uh, depending on, um, yeah. On, on what is exactly planned. So this is still not absolutely decided. And um, I will give a brief overview about the instruments. So um, it's kind of a, uh, a text loaded page and, uh, but as a, um, as a presentation is recorded, I think you can come back and you also find uh, this information on the webpage. Um, if you go to facility and instruments and uh, have a closer look on all these instruments. So the first one is called FXE, stands for femtosecond X-ray experiments. And it mainly um, performs chemical and biochemical reactions in liquids using a range of different scattering and diffraction and um, spectroscopy approaches. Um, then there's high energy density matter, which is um, maybe not as relevant uh, for biological applications because it's more focused on extreme conditions uh, like in what happens in exoplanets and so on. Um, then we have MID, um, which stands for Material Imaging and Dynamics. And uh, it also um, looks at a, a different range of, um, like a broad range of applications from glass formation and magnetism, but it also extends to some biological applications with cells and viruses and so on. Um, I put the names of the group leaders here. Um, so it might be the first point of contact if you have more specific questions. In general, information about all these instruments um, you can yeah, you can get on the webpage and also like for example at the 
um, XFAL user meeting, which is uh, always done con connected to the DAISY user meeting end of January, might be a good point if you're interested in a certain instrument and want to learn more if maybe there's an instrument suitable for uh, performing an experiment um, that you, you are interested. Then we have SCS, spectroscopy coherent scattering, um, which is basically going in the direction of single particle imaging um, of um, yeah, non-reproducible um, um, biological objects. And then the main beam line that is used um, in, for biological applications, at least so far, um, is called SPB, SFX. So it's a combination of single particle imaging of biomolecules, this is the SPB part, and serial from the second crystallography. Um, and then the last beamline uh, um, instrument is SQS, small quantum systems, um, yeah, to finish this up. So um, the instruments are in the basement and above these instruments in the, in the, in the next level floor, we have a, a range of uh, labs. And um, this is also the XBI lab located on top of the instruments. It's a large biological lab area, like 500 square, me square meters which hosts um, a big wet lab area in the center, and then a range of functional rooms around the main, main lab in the center. That lab was initially funded by a user consortium that invested money in establishing this lab at European XFAL, and this is now taken over by European XFAL and fully staffed and operated um, by, yeah, by, by European XFAL. So we basically can support uh, on a broad range of experiments, although of, of course in the end for, for the instruments downstairs, um, the last steps of sample characterization and sample injection are, are most interesting. But in principle, we can um, start from the cloning and expression in different organisms like E. coli or insect cells, go over protein purification and have extensive tools for protein characterization also available in the lab. And um, then we can do some screening and protein crystallization. Um, and we, this has been, have been used for users in the past. And now we are also using this extensively for Corona research um, as user presence on site is limited since a year. And um, yeah, so in principle, you, you can do much more than just like testing your final sample before injection. Um, and we will come to some of these points um, during the talk. So as you probably know um, and are aware, um, this is kind of the workflow of um, um, protein crystallography and drug discovery um, using traditionally synchrotrons to get your diffraction data and in an iterative approach, um, identify lead compounds um, and so on. So where's the XFAL standing? So it's an alternative approach for data collection um, compared to the synchrotrons and it is connected to different requirements on the sample. Um, this are want to highlight now. So what is the difference of X files compared to synchrotrons? So X files produce um, 10 to the power of nine times um, brighter um, um, beam, photon beam, and therefore the exposure time is much shorter compared um, to a synchrotron um, exposure to, to get a, si a similar signal. But as the pulses are so intense, um, the exposed sample bursts in a Coulomb explosion directly after exposing and um, like you can only get one single um, image from, from each sample. The, the reason that you can get a single image is that the pulses are so short that the molecule is exploding and ionized or bonds are ionized, but there's no time for the, the atoms to displace before the diffraction pattern is recorded on the detector. So therefore you basically recorded a diffraction pattern of a sample that when you record it has already um, um, yeah, it's already destroyed. And that means that for each image and each diffraction pattern you want to um, observe, you have to bring a new sample into the beam. And then you record over many, many different orientations. And these are then random orientations. And this is also a big difference compared to synchrotron data, where for example, in protein crystallography, um, traditionally you mount a crystal in a loop and then you rotate it 360 degree and you always know in which orientation your crystal was um, when you get your full data set. So in our case, we have the random orientations and we have to inject many crystals. Um, and then over time, we can um, cover the whole reciprocal space and get a full data set. So there are many different applications um, or like assembly delivery techniques established by now. And this is not a full collection. It's just an, um, an overview. 
And initially it was basically pushed by the XFIL, uh, emerging XFIL sources, but now it's also, there are also many applications of serial crystallography at synchrotrons. So it's, uh, it's not um, that this is only true for XFILs. Um, there are also many experiments that are possible. For example, at the, at the beamline um, at Petra 3, at the T-Rex beamline uh, where Arvin is also responsible for. Um, I want to focus now on the uh, on one injection technique in the beginning um, for serial femtosecond crystallography, and that uses um, a GDVN, which is an abbreviation for gas dynamic nozzle, um, virtual nozzle. And as I said, the sample has to be replenished very rapidly because the pulse structure at European XFL um, is consisting of a burst of um, um, photon pulses, and then there's a long gap in between them, and then there's another burst coming. So in these bursts, burst um, um, pulses are separated only by a very short time, and therefore there's only very little time to replace your sample um, in the beam. So you see here in this image that the FEL shoots a hole in the jet, and then this liquid jet where the sample is delivered has to be fast enough to, re to fill up the gap and replace the um, damaged um, area in the jet with new fresh sample. Otherwise, you can't record a um, new diffraction pattern. The second pulse would just hit the hole that was produced previously. And there, there's even more to it because um, if you look at this um, figure here, there's a jet, uh, there's a, a XFL pulse shooting a hole in the jet. And not only the, uh, the, the hole is a problem that has to be filled by the um, like upcoming sample, there's also a shock wave traveling up inside the jet. And um, experiments from um, Marie-Louise Grünbein from Emma Schlichting's group have shown um, that you have to replace even more sample to bring in undamaged um, fresh sample into the beam. And um, you can see here a few images of jets with different water and helium pressure. Um, and the helium is used to accelerate your, the, the uh, liquid sample and to reduce the uh, sample amount that is needed for these experiments. And um, um, Juraj Knoska from Henry Chapman's group uh, has done a nice review or like a summary of, of different experimental conditions where you can see um, how the jet speed and the diameter of the jet and all these parameters change when you change the water flow and the gas flow. And um, it has shown that to replace this sample in to, with undamaged um, um, crystals, um, you need jet speeds of about 50 meter per second, um, which is quite fast and to, yeah, to, to outrun the damage from the shock wave. Um, just as a rule of thumb, of course, the actual numbers depend on the experiment, but that's a good, good estimate. So what is now the advantage of this um, um, new serial approach um, at, at FELs? And of course, one of the main um, targets are time-resolved experiments. And the first question you should ask yourself is what is the, uh, the time scale I'm interested in? Because um, biological reactions start from very fast chemical um, changes um, over then conformational changes um, and go up to the biological uh, longer um, events like um, cell division and everything that is like slower. So you need to check uh, what is your interested uh, time scale and conformational changes and so on. Um, and enzyme reactions are usually happening in the micro to millisecond range. So this is a good, um, good range for, for many um, biological experiments, time-reserved experiments. So one problem is if you do crystallography to investigate um, dynamic processes is that if you imagine this would be a crystal and each um, protein in the crystal does an enzymatic reaction that you want to observe, and it's in a different state of the enzymatic reaction that the outcome in, in the end is a, a blurred image. You can see the core body that is still visible, but the floppy and interesting parts like where the action is happening um, are very uh, blurry and you don't really get a clear image. So somehow you need to synchronize all your proteins in a crystal to, um, to be able to get a high resolution um, image of, of your dynamic reaction. And how is this done? So again, we see kind of a um, simplified um, overview of, the, of these time scales, and it's not only XFELs um, that can do um, dynamic reactions, also synchrotrons are very well capable of this, and they also extend um, 
to the millisecond and even microsecond range and with some more advanced applications, of course, they can even push this, but this is, let's say, the conservative um, time scales and X files can be a bit faster um, and as well to the lower time range, there's not really a difference. So for the synchronization, what are the experimental approaches? And one approach is the mixing. And the second approach is the pump probe. So in mixing, you have your crystals and then they are mixed with a substrate and uh, the substrate diffuses into the crystal and the delay between the mixing and the probing by the X-ray pulses determine your time delay in your reaction. And you can do rapid mixing experiments or maybe something like pH jump where you change the pH in, in your crystals and induce a reaction. And if this is not fast enough, which would be like more in the millisecond time range, you can do pump probe experiments for photolysis or photo cage release um, and temperature jump, which I will come uh, back to later. And there you have your microcrystals and you have a pump, optical pump pulse that excites the reaction. And then with some time delay, you have your X-ray probe pulse to probe um, the reaction. But of course, um, this is limited to um, certain groups of uh, biochemical reactions, and I will highlight these in a second. So let's start with the mixing approach. What, what happens during the, these mixing experiments? So you have your mixer, and your sample is mixed with your buffer and then injected into the interaction region where the X-rays are focused. And of course, there are two events happening. First, the buffer needs to mix with your crystal slurry. And um, the, this is some mixing time that you have to take into account. And then you have the diffusion time of the substrate into the crystal. And there was a nice um, um, study by Marius Schmidt um, who um, calculated the diffusion time of glucose into crystals. And you can see that this is one reason why you need small crystals to perform these kinds of experiments. Because if you have like a, a bigger crystal, it takes milliseconds or even seconds to diffuse into the crystal. So of course, this determines your temporal resolution of the reaction that you can study. Um, but if, you, if the crystal size gets smaller, and the advantage is that at x files you can um, use very tiny crystals to get sufficient signals, to get su sufficient signal, you end up uh, in a low um, mi like millisecond or even microsecond time regime. And the combination of the mixing time and the diffusion time um, together basically limits or gives you the time resolution of your um, like maximum time resolution that you can get. And uh, keep in mind, like average turnover of, a, um, of enzymatic reaction is something like 70 milliseconds. So if you do the experimental design correctly, it can well be in the range where you can study these reactions. Um, and then there was a study um, by um, Mario Schmidt's group as well, by Surai uh, Pandey, and um, they investigated the diffusion of a substrate into lactamase, beta lactamase crystals. And you can see here, it's a relatively small crystal with two micrometer thickness, and um, the length in this case doesn't matter too much, but you can still see that after 10 milliseconds, diffusion is not complete inside the crystal, and it takes something like 30 milliseconds before you get a uniform um, distribution of your substrate into the crystal. So if your reaction is faster than these 30 milliseconds, then you get again the, the blurred image of the reactions. Um, so you should aim for intermediates um, that are um, slower than this. And if this is not um, fast enough for your experiments, then you can um, aim for pump probe experiments. And there you have a pump laser exciting your crystals. Um, and then with a certain time delay, you have your X-rays um, probing your crystals. And the delay time between both determine your temporal resolution. Um, but there, you need to be careful because the high laser power um, that is needed, and it's usually higher than in spectroscopy experiments because we want to ex excite like most of the molecules in the crystal and spectroscopy is sensitive to smaller changes. Um, you need relatively large laser power. And the intuitive way would be to just increase the laser power to be sure that you excite everything. But then um, there was a there is a nice um, illumination guideline from um, uh, Image Lichting's group as well, um, where they highlight that multiphoton excitation can introduce artifacts. So if you expose your crystal with too high intense laser power, then you induce artifacts like uh, radicals and higher excited states um, that kind of um, 
yeah, make it difficult to differentiate between um, the reaction you want to analyze and the artifacts that are produced. And you can see in this graph that if you have a crystal um, that is 10 micrometer uh, thick and you do your, you adjust your laser power correctly, you get this mixture of 35% of the proteins have not seen a photon inside, then 40% get a single photon and 25% get multi photons. So even if you adjust the laser power, there's always this distribution of zero, one, and more photons um, per chromophore of your, of your molecule. So you should be in a range um, that your signal um, scales linearly, linearly with the pump laser intensity. Otherwise, you, you will get a very high fraction of this multi-photon multi excitation. Um, and the smaller your crystal gets, the easier it is to avoid this multi-photon excitation. So both mixing and pump probe experiments actually favor small molecules to synchronize your reaction and it makes it easier. Um, the outcome of these kind of experiment was um, like the first molecular movie um, at European XFEL using a kind of intuitive sample, which is a naturally light sensitive <coughs> protein, um, which is photoreactive yellow protein. And it was um, exposed to light. And then they probed these very fast time points in the cycle to see the transis um, uh, turnover. And this was at 10, 30, and 80 picoseconds. So these very um, high, um, like fast time points, um, you, you would not really easily um, achieve at, at synchrotron experiments. So this is one of the advantages of XFELs if you're interested in, the, in these fast reactions. Another approach that hasn't been, to my knowledge, has been established at XFELs yet, but is quite promising for the future, um, is to trigger reactions in naturally non-light sensitive proteins, because of course not all proteins are naturally light sensitive, um, by using um, infrared pulses. And these infrared pulses can excite uh, the, the stretch, uh, OH stretch bond and therefore induce heating in the sample. And you can have very short pulses to like heat up your, your water in, in your protein. Um, and then with a certain lag phase in the um, not, like the heating is in the nanosecond range and then the lag phase takes about a microsecond, you, you can induce conformational changes. And by this, you can map the conformational energy landscape of a protein um, and, and see like what is, what is the naturally um, conformational changes that occur easily. So this is a very promising technique for um, performing time resolved experiments in, in the future, um, but it's still in the development phase, I would say. So maybe to sum up some of the sample requirements um, for um, time resolved experiments, you need very high crystal densities. As I mentioned, each, each um, diffraction pattern needs a new sample and therefore you need <clears throat> a high sample um, density and high sample amount. And the density basically determines your hit rate, um, how often um, an X-ray pulse it really hits the crystal inside your jet. And these numbers are quite high. So 10 to 11 crystals per milliliter are needed to get a decent hit rate for the ex experiment. Um, and of course, this has requirements for the sample preparation, which I will also come, come back to in a moment. And then you need a homogeneous crystal size. If you have a heterogeneous crystal size, as I said, um, the fusion times will be uh, different for each crystal and also the uh, penetration depths of the optical laser will be different. So aiming for small crystals is good for these time resolved experiments. And this of course um, um, makes use of, of the uh, potential of x files to get a decent signal for also um, tiny crystals. And again, this comes to re-optimize uh, your established protocols for crystallization. Um, to aim for these homogeneous small crystals instead of a single big one. Um, you need large sample amounts, not only high um, concentration, but also high, high volume. So um, if you're interested in several time points, you need a full data set for each time point. And um, therefore, if you want to record a like, so-called molecular movie with several time points, um, you are easily in the milli milliliter range of sample with this high concentration. So this can be a large burden on the person in the lab who has to produce all this sample for
for the experiment. And um, then for the injection, you need to keep in mind the viscosity of your sample and do some jet tests to be sure that your sample can be injected if you decide for GDVN injection. If, if this is not possible, then maybe it's a good way to think about alternative sample delivery methods um, if you can't inject it in a liquid jet. And uh, of course, in the end, you need good protection crystals to perform your experiment. Um, but talking about these samples, um, um, an often uh, called question is like, if, if the sample gets very small and your crystals get very tiny, how do I really identify them, how homogeneous they are and um, if it's really crystalline and so on. And in the XPI lab, we have a range of techniques because that's, there's not a single one uh, technique that can be, can be used to cover this. Um, and we always combine different approaches to, to be sure that we can validate or characterize the sample. So first, of course, there are a range of techniques for size determination, traditional uh, microscopy, for example, light microscopy using stereo microscopes. But as you can see here, um, if the crystals get smaller than one or two micrometer, it's quite hard to distinguish if this is still crystalline or it's amorphous um, aggregation, and you can, can't judge it really well. And you can use fluorescent microscopes, as in this case of this in vivo grown crystals in the cells, which kind of where the cell produce a protein and then the crystals grow inside the cells, um, which gets you a bit better resolution. Or you use an environmental scanning electron microscope um, where you can even get higher resolution and advantage of this environmental um, version of the scanning EM is that you can use residual water, as you see in this image. Um, you, of course, you lose a bit of resolution, but the advantage is that you don't have to stabilize your crystals um, in water and cross-link or do any, any kind of this preparation. You can just use it in the crystallization condition and um, uh, reduce the, the water and um, image in residual water, which is a nice technique. And then there are some techniques that have a um, limitation to the maximum size, which is mainly um, diffusion um, limited approaches like dynamic light scattering or single particle tracking. And this is usually more useful for nanocrystals or for example, if you prepare your sample with a seeded batch approach, you can characterize your seed stocks with these um, um, techniques. And then there are a few techniques which are not only providing information about the size, but also qualitative information, which can be sonic or TEM, or then um, diffraction techniques like X-ray, electron, or powder diffraction. And we have a um, transmission, cryotransmission electron microscope for this in the lab. Um, and the, the, the simple approach is to take your nanocrystals and stain them with, um, uh, with a dye, like uranyl acetate, for example. And as you can see in these images for nanocrystals, it's quite nice because if the crystal gets too thick, um, the electrons can't penetrate anymore. But for these nanocrystals, um, you get a transmission image and you can see a nanocrystal here in this, um, um, yeah, in, in this uh, image. And if you um, zoom in in this area, you can see the letters of the crystal. And this gives you information about the degree of order. And in this case, we could even overlay it um, with the crystal packing uh, nicely, uh, which showed uh, the, uh, the order of the crystals. Um, if you have other uh, samples like this in vivo ground crystals, um, you can use an ultra microtome to make thin sections of embedded samples and look um, inside the cell in which compartment maybe the crystals can grow. And this example is an ongoing research project in our group with some colleagues and in collaboration with Lars Redeke from University of Lübeck. Um, and the last example I want to highlight is not really a time-resolved experiment, but another nice example where FELs are quite useful. Um, and it goes in the same direction of in vivo grown crystals. Um, and there was a proposal by Dominique Oberture in collaboration with Colin Berry from Cardiff University. And um, naturally, Bacillus thuringiensis produces some delta endotoxins. And these are then, um, produced in these bacteria um, as in vivo grown protein crystals and then released um, from these bacteria. And you can see in this SEM image, the, the spores of the bacteria and the crystals. And then if, if there are insects consuming the bacteria or the, the uh, 
um, leaves where the bacteria grow. Um, the crystals dissolve inside the guts upon a pH shift, and then the protein becomes active and uh, acts as a toxin for these uh, insects. And as these crystals are naturally produced, you can't like change the size and optimize your protocols because they grow inside the, the cells. Um, they are a great target for FEL experiments because they are sub-micrometer in size. And we used, again, the TEM to characterize these samples. And um, you can see uh, that it gives a range. You, like on the left side, you, you get information about size distribution and how uniform your sample is. And then you can, if you zoom in more, magnify more, you get information, do I rather have spores or do I see the crystals? And for the very high resolution, you can again see the letters. And as the samples are so small, we could even do um, electron diffraction to verify that these are really um, ordered lattices. And it's hard to see in these small images, but if you zoom in, you can on the left side see the lattice and then on the right side you get diffraction. Of course, this diffraction is not suitable to solve the structure with our like condition and microscope that was not cryo preparation or anything, but it, um, in relation to different batches that you have, you can select the batch that performs best for the experiment at the XFL. And then, yeah, they used liquid jet to inject these samples, got diffraction pattern um, and could solve the structure of uh, four to five new um, uh, toxins of these bacteria that were so far unknown. And this is um, the first data sets from novel structures that haven't been solved before from European XFL. And yeah, still in preparation and under um, script preparation is ongoing. So yeah, with this, I would like to sum up. Um, for time-resolved experiments, first of all, you need to know what is your reaction time scale you're interested in, uh, which instruments are suitable to perform the experiment at, and um, do I really need um, um, an FEL or can I do the experiment at the synchrotron? And then the big question is how do you synchronize your reaction? Can you do mixing experiments or is your sample light sensitive or maybe temperature jump or anything like this? Um, and at least for XFELs, as I mentioned, the smaller crystals, the more easy it is to synchronize your reaction usually and you, you get a decent signal also with small crystals and you need a homogeneous crystal size for also this synchronization uh, purpose. Um, and do a careful pre-characterization of your mixing times and so on. Otherwise, you don't really know in which reaction time point you are looking at in your data set. So this is essential to evaluate the data and make sense of the, of the data you obtained. And then in the end, um, you have to think about what sample quantities are needed and please also invest time for testing sample delivery um, otherwise, you will be wasting your precious um, beam time in the end if this is not optimized before the experiment. Um, yes, and for the lab area, um, if you're interested in more details, just have a look on the web page. And um, especially if you're interested in the, in the bio lab area, um, we have extens extensive infrastructure also for biophysical characterization. And if you have questions regarding this, maybe for HALOS six months project, as was mentioned, um, or in general for XFED proposals for an upcoming experiment, please don't hesitate to contact us. And we are happy to help and also want to attract users that are not XFED experts yet um, and maybe support them to get a sample to a stage where they have a higher success um, chance with writing proposals and getting beam time. So yeah, if you are potential in, potentially interested, um, you're welcome to, to write us and we can discuss and with this, I want to thank you for your kind attention and uh, the team of the sample environment and characterization group I'm working in, especially the XBI bio team with Christina Hijong, Tina, Lea, Yekaterina, Jana, Inyaki, and Anais, and Joachim Schulz, who is the group leader of the sample environment group, and the whole XFEL staff and management, and um, some of the XBI users I showed images from, Lars, uh, Michael, and uh, Dominic. Yes. And thank you for your kind attention. And I think we have time for some questions. I mute myself. So thank you, uh, Robin, for a really fantastic um, talk. Uh, and I think, Kaiser, we can stop recording and move to the Q&A um, section.